Hello and welcome to the Greenock Blitz Walk. This video is intended to be played while actually doing the walk, but you can equally take this virtually in the comfort of your own home. My name is Vincent Gillen, social and local historian, and I will be guiding you on this short walk around the centre of Greenock. We will look at the official photographs of the damage done by the Luftwaffe and then compare them with photographs before and after. I will also tell you some stories from people who were actually there and experienced the Blitz. We are starting off in Clyde Square, opposite the Greenock Municipal Buildings. Take a seat if you like and we will start. Hamilton Street, with the original name of the street here, was where the municipal buildings were located. You are currently standing, if you look at the attached images, roughly where the lorry is in the first photograph. One month after the raid at Clyde Bank, the German Luftwaffe made their way to Clydeside once more. This time the targets were the important shipbuilding and engineering works of Greenock. The first alarm was raised at 1.09 in the morning when fire damage was reported at Sinclair Street in the east end of the town. Nearby Cuthcart Square was hit shortly thereafter and at Clyde Square the municipal buildings were hit at 3am and the roof was destroyed. If we look at the map of the bomb locations we will see exactly where the damage was caused. This map doesn't account for the fire bombs dropped however. Looking at the images on the app, you can see how much change there has been. There used to be one long stretch of road from the harbours. Cathcart Street, Cathcart Square, Hamilton Street and this Hall Street to the west of the town. A tram line ran along in front of us. Bomb damage and other alterations have made Greenock almost unrecognisable from this time. Buildings on the opposite side of the street to the municipal buildings where the swings were destroyed and this space was eventually cleared to form the square you are standing in now, though it has been altered significantly. At the time of the Blitz they put down a blaze covering and this led to the area being given the nickname of Red Square. It was subsequently made into a lovely laid out garden space prior to 1970 and then changed in the 1970s to how it looks today. William Morrison, a local policeman, recounts We were on 13 hours duty per day. We were informed what was required and when we went in May I was assigned to go on top of the municipal buildings along with Constable Cooney and Constable Smith and we were to climb right up to the top to throw off any incendiaries that came down on top of the buildings. We were up there when the raid started. John Johnson, a fireman, a fireman recalls. In the meantime my other unit had gone to the central area in Cuthcart Street and the entire front of the municipal buildings as we know it today had no roof on it. It was burning furiously and the danger was that it would spread and go into the main town hall building. Their presence saved the Greenock Town Hall because that fire would have spread right down to Dalrymple Street. There was a crater in the middle of the square where the Lyle Fountain is. I don't know how many feet deep it was but it was quite considerable and the Midkirk was very badly damaged. Let us now go over to the Cart Square where the fountain is and we will continue our story. We are now in Cuthcart Square. This was the main social centre of the, of the town since its inception in the early 18th century. This square has been a witness to a lot of historical events. On the night of the 6th of May 1941, a bomb exploded in the middle of the square. 
as well as leaving a deep crater, the, shrap the shrapnel and the blast cause damage to the Midkirk. Besides the tower for the municipal buildings, the Victoria Tower, you can see an empty space. This was called Cowan's Corner. Originally meant to be part of the municipal building plans, the owners refused to sell. And so it was, by a strange twist of fate, destroyed by bombs on those nights, and to this day the plot has lain empty. You can see in the photograph where there's a woman walking towards the camera the image of the building that was there before. This image was later used in an advert for Marmalade in Canada. The lady's bag was made to look as if it was full of oranges and the strap line was that she was still going about doing her shopping despite the blitz going on around her. Mr Stewart recalls my sister was an ambulance drive driver and she came along the Midkirk and there was a bomb exploded right outside and she'd been machine gunned and the ambulance was riddled with bullets and the people inside were dead but when she came to she was right inside this crater. I don't know exactly what happened but I remember her saying that all she could remember was the sound of the machine gun. She spent a lot of time with I think it was Dr Kerr, you know, laying out the dead bodies and such like. We'll now be moving along to Cathcart Street. Street. If you look at the bomb damage map, you can see the location of the damage at Duff Street on your left is now. Buildings have been demolished and replaced by more modern architecture. You can always get clues to historic change in a town through its street architecture. In this case, the answer to change was the German raids of 1941. Mary Thomas recalls, The driver took us down Bank Street and the Victoria Tower was on fire. The tower was on fire. I think it was more frightening for us than coming out of the house and seeing nothing left of our own. If you look at the two photographs that are part of this section, you can see one taken at the corner of Cathcart Street and Duff Street. I love this image because you can just see old boy on the bottom corner and just imagine that happening today, you know. <laughs> he wouldn't be allowed within a hundred yards of the of the scene. The other photograph is one of the best photographs, I think, uh, taken by James Hall, the official wartime photographer. Looking back towards the Cathcart Square, the Cathcart Square and the Midkirk, you can get a real sense of the occasion, the the darts, the 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 workers clearing up after the, the night before. Uh, a really evocative photograph. This piece is taken from an article in the Greenock Tilly after the Blitz. Across the river from Greenock, the darkly wooded Hullamore Peninsula blots out the flat farmland that was once an ACAC gun site. The place where so many of us had our baptism of fire. It was from here, beyond the black horizon of the trees, that we saw the bomb kindled fire finally illuminate the sky above Greenock on the fateful night of the 7th of May. And it was from the Nissen hut surrounding the long barrelled four inch guns that we scrambled in various stages of undress to answer the alarm. There was a mad rush to the ammunition dugouts to uncan the yard long shells and feverish, and feverish fumblings in our dockets for the vital horseshoe nails with which to set the time fuses on the shell caps. Above us, from away back beyond the Kilpatrick Hills in our rear, Enemy planes were droning in to their bomb range, with that curious but unmistakable booming roar which all dread feeling. Across the river our families, for the 83rd Heavy Anti-Aircraft Regiment had a good sprinkling of Greenock and District men in its ranks, would be excitedly rushing to the shelters. We could picture our families huddled in their propped up dungeons, crowding into Anderson shelters, 
perhaps shelters, perhaps drawing comfort from one another in closes protected from blast by baffle walls. They were less than three miles away from us across the Clyde. Were they safe? Was anyone safe as those bombs and incendiaries rained from the sky? To us, standing behind these guns, the consoling thought, for what it was worth, that we had something to retaliate with. The folk across the water had nothing. They just had to hide in their shelters and hope for the best. It was just approaching midnight on the 6th of May when the alert came to our gun sight. Every man in the camp, every man in the camp, standing by as he had never been since the token raid the night before, rushed to his station. All that day the guns had been traversed and retraversed in, ra- in readiness. The question on every man's lips as he sipped his supper tea had been, would the raiders come back? Had that sally the night before just been a preliminary canter? I looked to see, to find out the vulnerability of the Clydeside area. Then came the purple warning, the shrilling notes of the alarm bells in the huts, the shrieking whistles, the soldiers' battle cry, stand to, stand to, to. In the corner of the great field was our gun site. The radar aerials, we called it radio location then, were searching the night sky. The greenish pictures on the cathode ray tubes were crowded with the blips of planes in the vicinity. No sooner was one wave plotted in the control room than they came to the picture. On reflection, it was not so much a question of how many planes we brought down, or didn't, but how many our gunfire scared away, or caused to waver on their course as they came in to launch their cargoes of death and destruction. The unforgettable smell of cordite surrounded the gun pits. We tasted it, we smelled it. Our throats were parched, our ears deafened with the crash of the guns. Over Greenock the sky was like an orange blanket, illumined first by the earliest bombs on the Argown distillery. It darkened, then for a moment the town glittered with the town glittered with silvery spangles as thousands of incendiaries were dropped. Fire after fire broke out. Quiet spoken soldiers, young men married and single, who a few months earlier had been leading peaceful lives in their civilian jobs, swore and fumed. It was done at the double. Even the army cooks, boiling huge urns of tea and jamming tea and jamming pieces for the men at the guns, had thrown off their accustomed cam and were running from gun pit to gun pit with mugs of steaming tea and sandwiches. The tea was needed to restore our jangled nerves the sandwiches, which were munched or forgotten, thrown aside as we brought out the ammunition or handed up the shells to the men at the guns. Angle and bearing orders echoed around the gun site, voiced by hoarse, by hoarse-throated gunners. Sergeant sparked instructions: number one gun, fire; number two gun, fire. Then everybody forgot the numerical sequence, and it was fire at will. The planes still roared overhead, their queer halting drone sounding very much like For you, for you, for you. Among the shells and far away starlight twinkles, maddeningly, maddeningly near but mostly just not near enough. For hours on end the guns barked and the planes droned. Across in Greenock and Gurok and Port Glasgow, The blazing sky seemed to reflect the town's funeral pyre. Shells still burst on the sky, our own the shells of other guns stationed up and down the river, the Navy's shells. Then as dawn began to tinge the sky, the enemy was the enemy was gone, the nightmare was over. It became morning and the sun looked down on the quiet waters of the Clyde, and on the green fields around Hillamore. It seemed for a moment that the experiences of the night had all been a dream. But across the river latted, pebbles strewn shores, the pall of smoke that was going up showed that it was no dream after all. The fury of the night had passed, and folk wondering if they were safe. From here, from here we will move further along the street to the next corner at Terrace Road.
here we look at more photographs and hear more stories about the nights of the park. We are now at the corner of Kirkcart Street and Terrace Road. Terrace Road is on our right as it goes up past the Well Park. We aren't going to go up the hill, we will be carrying on along Cathcart Street. If you look at the picture of the foot of Terrace Road taken in the 90s by Eugene Miha, you can see in the background the air raid shelters that were on the hillside. This building was removed in the late 1960s. John Stewart remembers, We were also deployed to assist with various incidents throughout the downtown area and I found myself damping down fires on Terrace Road at the welfare offices which had been firebombed and were still ablaze. Orr's furniture store, further up Terrace Road, had not escaped the fires and had been used to store some of the bodies from the previous night. Some of the tales circulating about that were scary to say the least. It was said that when the bodies got hit the next night, they all sat up with the heat and scared the SH1T out of everyone. James Liddell recalls, At the mortuary of Princess Pier we had the unclaimed bodies of eight infants, not any of them older than a year or 18 months. We photographed them all, they were never claimed, and we buried them privately in the Greenock Cemetery. Charlie Fry recalls, Strange thing, a wee story. I dreamt I dwelt in marble halls. It's supposed to be a bad omen tune, if you play it. Strangely enough, Alec McKechnie, he got killed when the bombs fell on Belleville Street, and then they shifted his body to Terrace Road. Well, the co-op had a hall there, and they put the bodies in there, and it got a direct hit, and they never found the bodies. Strange. Anyway, that was one of Alex's favourite tunes, although it was an old semi-classical type, he put it into a foxtrot tempo. But he always played that quite a lot, and this is what happened to him. Stores on Cuthcart Street were damaged and fittings strewn around. The counter from one of the Italian shops was still with the cash in it. All the candy was there too, the sweetie bottles. On Terrace Road, at the, to at the top, there was a US Forces social club. An unfortunate event took place here, and an 18-year-old US serviceman murdered two British Marines. He was jailed for 50 years and discharged from the Navy. Looking ahead along Cuthcart Street, you can see that the age of the buildings have changed substantially. This street used to go straight to the old harbours, but now is intersected by the main road. After the row of shops on Station Avenue, leading to the Central Station, let us head over there.
past the James Watt pub on your left, which used to be the Greenock Post Office, and the buildings on the right, we come to Station Avenue, which is leading up to the central station. Looking at the photographs here, you can see just how much damage was caused. The two photographs showing the area after the war give a clear indication of the damage as well. This was where Black's Tents, which later went on to become part of North Face, had their business premises. The Sugar Exchange, for which Greenock is famous, was also here where they bought and sold the sugar stocks. We're now going to walk along to the main road and turn right towards Morrison's. If we take a look at the photographs in this section, you'll see the first one described as Rouen Street at Virginia Street. There is one section of Virginia Street left, and that's across the road towards the harbour. But on your right, it would continue through what is now Morrison's. Rouen Street, as it was known, is the main way out of town, and during the Blitz, the whole area was a scene of devastation and panic everyone trying to escape. The street was narrow and congestion was inevitable. The reason the street is so wide today was a direct cause of the Blitz. The narrow streets of the time and the fact that it was, and still is, the only way out of the area meant that lessons had to be learned in the event of another emergency. And so we see the changes here. One poor gentleman Alan McFadgen, a, McFadgen, a skipper of a fishing smack, was killed by a bus here in 1940 on the nights when there was a blackout. The next photograph is looking back towards Virginia Street from roughly where the fire station is. The buildings on the left in the photograph are now the fire station and the furthest away building on the site of Morrison's petrol garage was where the Western SMT's bus carriage stood. We'll walk along to the fire station and cross at the crossing there. Mrs Elizabeth Hevener recalls, We went outside and experienced momentary relief as we saw many neighbours come out from houses and shelters. Shock replaced the relief as we saw that a bungalow three houses along had disappeared and a pile of rubble lay there instead. We learned later that 11 people had been killed. Mobile canteens arrived on and hot drinks helped to calm everyone down. Most of the talk was about leaving the town. The sooner the better.
approach the traffic lights beside the fire station, stop and look right up the hill. High explosives and incendiary bombs are raining down for several hours each night of the raids. At the top of the hill, the bombs struck the Argown distillery and Berry Yard sugar refinery. A flaming river of fire ran down the hill towards where we are standing now. The fire station stands on the site of St Lawrence's Roman Catholic Church, church which was destroyed by fire. You can see the image of the burnt out church on the app. John Johnson, the firefighter, recalled, Because it was when they knocked down the bonded warehouse, the wall fell out into Ingleson Street and exposed all the floors, and these barrels of liquid were actually falling out onto the rubble and bursting and causing leakage. And we could see from where we were at the top of Baked, you could see these barrels going down and then igniting. It was another unit that was looking after that lot. We were quite glad and we had plenty on our hands without being involved in that. And I think it was that burning liquid that set St Lawrence's Chapel on fire. I think the stuff entered the sewers and then it came up in the confined atmosphere of the church. It really was intense because that church was some fire. Again, looking just up beyond the railway bridge was the Greenock Electricity Power Station. This was put out of action quite quickly. And you can see from the attached aerial image where the bombs fell, creating great damage and loss of life in the eastern part of the town. Mr Stewart, Stewart recalls, But the second night of the Blitz, the whole family, my father was an air raid warden of that district, and the second night the whole family and myself were in shelters, just down in Dellingburn Street, just behind the power station. So those bombs came down. Now there were three of them. There were three shelters and one landed between the two shelters and the second landed between the other one, right bang beside each other, and the third one was a wee bit further over. Yes, shed to bits as well. So I went out to the shelter and once they'd passed to see and I saw a bloke coming down in a parachute. I thought it was a pilot, so I went over, I went over and I had taken my rifle with me. I said, I'll get this bloke and I went through a big wall into a wee bungalow. The damn thing happened to be a landmine, so it blew up behind the power station, and it blew a big lorry parked in the power station right into the back garden of the wee cottage. So I got out of there quite fast. So I went up to the house and the dog was sitting in a big armchair, and a great big photograph had come off the wall and was wrapped around the dog's neck. Jim Reynolds Walking round the town on this occasion, it was again, it was the smells. There were the reels of hoses lying across the streets, as I mentioned earlier. The water hydrants were not in use, and the fire brigade had to use the water from Victoria Harbour. Of course, you had all these hoses with special wooden wedges to allow the traffic to run over them, without bursting them, all over the town. The smell of burning wood, and again that smell of lath and plaster walls at the end of the day. Thomas Irvin. Well, I left the house, my house in Eldon Street, just opposite the torpedo factory. Of course, there were no buses and we had to walk, and by the time we got along to Grey Place, the place was covered. It was in shambles. The place was covered, the road was covered with glass, which was being swept up by the Royal Navy personnel. It was a case of crunching through the glass until you got to Scots. When we got there, the drawing office was no longer there. It had been burnt down, and quite a number of places in the works had been bombed. No roofs in them, the roofs all blown away. And we just set to and tried to sort things out. The first was opened the drawing safe in the drawing office, and found that apart from some water damage, most of the drawings were in good order. The drawings of course were saved, were saved because there was a very strict procedure, that you rolled up the drawings before you left the night before, and they were put in a safe, and lifted out of the safe first thing in the morning. Carl Gordon A little after dawn on a May morning in 1940, some people emerged from the depths of a school boiler house in Greenock. At the same moment, an open lorry passed by. On top were six or, six or seven bodies neatly laid side by side, 
and each covered with a new Hessian sugar bag. They were men taken from the steamy rubble of a sugar refinery, hit during a two-night blitz by 350 Luftwaffe bombers. The scene remains one of my most vivid memories of the war. I was, t- I was 10 years old and I can remember, after the sounding of the air raid sirens, the scramble as my family ran from our home with blankets and a few other essential belongings. It was moonlight and when we made from the school building, tracer bullets were already making patterns in the sky. The remainder of the night was spent huddled in a boiler house. There was a continual noise of exploding bombs accompanied by falling plaster and lighting failures for the next few hours. Then we came out and I saw the first dead I had ever seen in my life. So if we now walk past the fire station, you'll come to a pedestrian crossing and we're going to go across the across the road towards where the majority of bombs fell that night, resulting in great loss of life and damage to property. This was the east end of the truly populated, especially with those who worked in the shipyards and engineering works. John Stewart. There was an Edinburgh policeman there. We asked him if this public house was open at the end of Ingleson Street and Crescent Street. And he said, oh aye, the pub's open. So I detailed two lads to go and they were only to have a glass of beer and come right back. And they came back and were looking for this Bobby. They would have killed him, I believe, because the pub was was blown wide open. There was neither spirits, beer, nor a gantry, nor anything to be seen. It had been bombed out of existence. But it was quite funny, you know. The pub was open. Oh aye, it was open. Wide open. The harbour in front of you was a great scene of activity. It was being used as a water supply for the fire engines, as the main water main in town had been destroyed. It was here that Donald McKinvin of the fire of the fire service was killed while serving on the fire float in the harbour. John Johnson, the water we actually got was what was called the brown water supply. It was used by various industries in the upper part of the town, finally flowing into the Victoria Harbour. But we used that water for the firefighting in the entire distillery incident and we were there until about six o'clock the following night which would be on the 8th. Then we were relieved by a fire brigade unit from Edinburgh. At the Victoria Harbour a direct hit was scored at the back of the East Quay wall slightly north of the 100 ton fitting out crane. This caused the upper portion of the quay wall to bulge forward and leave a fairly large crater on the harbour side of the boundary wall between the harbour and Scotch shipbuilding yard. If you look at the other image, you will see a view of the Victoria Harbour 1847 with the Waverley. On your right, facing the river, was Scotch shipyard. It's now a call centre, but if you look at the aerial image, you can see quite clearly what it was like in 1940. A few ships being built, submarines, ships being repaired, a busy scene, a busy industrial scene. Journals. And the strange thing also was the following morning when I went to Scots to start work again, there was one bomb had landed between two destroyers in the berth, and one had fallen down off the berth, and one incendiary bomb had burned a lifeboat in one of the cruisers that was fitting out in the basin. That was the extent was the extent of the damage to the war effort as far as that blitz was concerned. I don't think one target that should have been hit was hit. The dockyard I mentioned received one bomb and one incendiary. It was all civilian hit casualties and the death toll of course was quite shocking because even 300 I think it was would have been killed had been killed was quite a number at that time in the war. Of course with various other blitzes in the war at Coventry and the Clyde Bank, this paled into insignificance, but for us it was an occasion which will remember, which will remain in the memory of people living through those terrible nights.
Mr Stewart. During the first night of the Blitz, I was in the Home Guard in Scots. We were armed, but had no blooming ammunition. So the first night of the Blitz, I was in Scots, and the bombers came over and dropped a string of bombs. They were building a cruiser at the time, and the armour plating for the hull was, you know, in a big A-frame, two plates together. So we were in there as the, bomb, as the bombs dropped. One of them split a destroyer, and another knocked a submarine off its slipway. Well, I was there that night. Oh, I was scared. There's no doubt of that. If we start walking towards the Beacon Arts Centre, you will perhaps notice a filled-in rock. This was at East India Harbour. Machinery here was completely destroyed, but the entrance gate stood fairly well to the blast and there was only slight leakage of water. Fairly extensive damage of a superficial nature was caused to premises throughout this area with the blast effect of bombs. The next section will give you more information on this dock and photographs will show the damage actually caused. This whole area was harbours and the repair yard of laments. You can place yourself by looking at the photograph of the Victoria Tower in the background. Throughout the war there was a series of accidental drownings here as people fell into the harbours during blackout. Now if you want to, take a walk towards the front of the custom house. Runok became the centre of what was called the Glade Emergency Anchorage. When the Germans took over France, the southern ports of England were no longer safe, so a large percentage of the convoys bringing food and troops from America later on in the war were sent to the Clyde. Over a million and a half American GIs arrived here, whilst the Allied troops fought in North Africa left from Greenock. Greenock was the base for the Navy ships that escorted the convoys across the Atlantic. We cannot undervalue the role that this area played during the war. We will now walk over towards Brunner Street, past the police station, and cross over the main road again, making our way back to Clyde Square via William Street. take a right and walk towards the statue of James Watt. Looking at the bomb map attached, we can see the bomb marker at the corner of Cathcart Street and Brimler Street. This area was one of the oldest parts of the town, and many of our 18th and 19th century buildings were destroyed. William Riddle. By the time of the attack, we had built a control room on the north side of Dalrymple Street, just opposite the municipal building. It was a spacious control room holding 30 to 40 people, and about 1.30 and 1.45 in the morning, a bomb landed 20 feet away on the roadway. The building jumped into the air and came down again, and we all grabbed for our steel helmets. We had been working without them. Morris Taggart During the group blitz, I can remember the wail of sirens and searchlights like great giant torches crisscrossing the sky. 
The droning noise of plane engines and the thunder-like boom-boom of the incendiary bombs being dropped all over Kunuk. The sky was lit up as the town was set alight, and I remember the clanging of fire engine bells as they raced through the streets in a desperate effort to put out the fires. Now we carry on over to over to where the James Watt statue is, and we'll make our way back up to Willow Street. Street will make a way back up towards Clyde Square. The attached map of the town shows the main locations where bombs were dropped. Delayed high explosive bombs are represented by blue dots in this map, not black. The, the other images show the view looking west from the foot of William Street. The mainly dark photograph is a remarkable photo taken from a Navy ship, ship on the Clyde. It shows Greenock alight. And if you look really carefully, you can just make out the Victoria Tower on the bottom right. James Riddle remembers. I went out just after the bomb had dropped to see what had happened. I got to the bomb crater just at the foot of William Street, and in it was a motorcycle, which I recognised as belonging to one of the older boys acting as a messenger. I knew him well, and all he was a motorcycle. I thought he had been killed but it turned out that he'd scrambled up from the crater and gone back to his post, leaving his motorbike behind. Another messenger, by the way, uh, Robert McCallum, would go on to win the British Empire Medal for his work those nights. I'll finish off now with a quote from Billy Sinclair. One woman whose name is stuck in my mind to this day is Hart. Now I class Mrs Hart the bravest woman I've ever known, and I think of her a lot. When we were alerted by the siren that bombs were due to drop on us, we all scrambled into our concrete Anderson shelter behind 20 Poplar Street in Gibbs Hill, Greenock. Mrs Hart was always there, night after night, and always stood by the door of the shelter. She would shout for us to get our heads down as far as we could, and then shouted for us to relax always had a list of songs for us to sing, which we sang loudly between the alerts. She kept us safe. I can honestly say I never saw anyone in that shelter frightened, even when the three-storey building in front of 20 Poplar Street, at the corner of East and Poplar Street, was razed to the ground. Mrs Hart kept her spirits high. We have now come to the end of our tour. End of our tour. I hope you've enjoyed the experience and it has given you an insight into the events of those two nights in May 1941 and how it affected Greenock and its people. It's an experience that is being repeated elsewhere in the world, even as we speak. If you did enjoy it, there is more information in my books on the Greenock Blitz and the Second World War Number Clyde, which are available from my website at carchbornpublishing.com. Thank you for your time. Farewell.